everyone out there. Welcome once again to one of our GalaxyCon chats. My name is Patty, and I am so excited tonight. I am sitting with a writer of so many mediums and so many genres, and he has he has elevated not only a convention culture, but he's also elevated the, the role of the of comic book characters within pop culture. So let's without further ado, let's please bring him on. GalaxyCon, please welcome to our virtual stage, Mr. Mark Guggenheim. Hey, hey, hey. That was really nice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your tremendous body of work. And and we'll we'll get into this a little bit, but uh, I I I I think you're a little more responsible for a rise in convention culture than you may realize. Hmm. But I, yeah, that's yeah. That news to me. <clears throat> that is, it is, it is. I'll, I'll I'll submit my theory to you in a little bit, but uh, first of all, how are you in these uh, interesting times that we're in? Um I'm, I would say, surprisingly good. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, you know, um, I, I've been very fortunate. Uh, my, my wife and my kids are doing great. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're hanging in there. You know, it's a day by day kind of thing, but so far so good. Thank you for asking. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, if, if you if you survived getting Crisis and Infinite Earths on TV, you could beat Corona. No question about that. Uh, I definitely felt like if I can survive that, I can survive anything. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, if it's okay with you, I would love to, let's just kind of go back to the beginning because uh, you are very much, I believe, the story of a, a young geek who really kind of went all the way. So uh, uh, what was... Um, how did this begin for you? Were you a uh, spinner rack kid? Because you got one there in the background. I actually, this is not just any spinner rack. Um, I, I was a spinner rack kid. Um, this actually is the spinner rack where I bought my very first comic book uh, and probably a good chunk of my collection. Uh, this is the actual one that I grew up with. From the place you would do? From the place you I would go. I would, I would, this is back in, ancient times in the 70s, um, I would ride my bike, you know, at seven years old and, you know, no helmet. Uh, I would ride to this little shopping center near my house and I would take my, you know, savings and I would buy comic books off of this very rack. Uh, when, when did you acquire that from the place? <laughs> That's a good question. I would think I was like 14, 15. Basically what happened was Hallmark, uh, they came in to a competing shopping center and the stationery store that I was buying my comic books from, he took like all of his money and put it into renovating a store so he could compete with Hallmark. Mm -hmm. And he put all of like his, you know, equipment and the racks and everything. And he put it in a vacant storefront in the shopping center. And I'm riding past it one day and I see it in there and I'm like, well, maybe he's getting rid of it and maybe he'll sell it to me. And he sold it to me for 10 bucks. And it is my most prized possession. Uh, and then an original Hey Kids comments one. Yes. I've, yeah. I've seen those uh, uh, up for eBay and I've, I've clicked on it. So I wonder how much, yeah, that's a little out of my range. Yeah. And uh, I know they've been doing some reproductions of them, but I, I want an original rusty one. That's well. It's you know for me. It's I, I remember you know I remember like taking you name it you know X Men one forty two off the rack you know um, it, so many seminal comics um, that have ended up in my collection um, literally were sitting in that rack. So it, it really uh, it, it has a special place in my heart. So. Uh Spin, being a spinner rack kid, what were the ones that uh, that you would you would hunt for? You know, it's funny. I grew up as a DC fan. You know, um, at, you know, I was really I never would have guessed that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I grew up as a DC fan, and then it wasn't until like I was like you know ten that I made the transition to. I wouldn't say actually transition is the wrong word because I always kept buying and reading DC comics. But I, you know, be added Marvel into my my reading, um, you know, starting when I was ten, and it really um, it's just been like that ever since. Where I read both DC and Marvel. Did uh, 
did you ever make a transition from the uh, spinner rack to start going to a, a specialty shop and then really getting into the expanded availability? Yeah, you know, I was a big Micronauts fan. Uh, this was a Bill Mantlo comic. And when Marvel started publishing into the direct market, they yeah. took two books. It was Kazar and Micronauts. Uh, took them and Moon Knight. Them. What? They did it with Moon Knight too. Oh, right, you're right, and Moon Knight. Uh, and took them out of the newsstands and they were only available in comic book shops. Um, and the the comic, the, my dad uh, had, still to this day has a store in Flushing and on his way home, he would stop off at this store called Mike's Comic Hut um, and he would pick up uh, comics for me. Um, and uh, Mike's Comic Hut was, was known, uh, George, this little known artist named George Perez would draw all of Mike's shopping bags and business cards. Um, and uh, then I would, uh, when, I, when I got a little bit older, I would take the bus, I would, I would take a bus with like two transfers from Port Washington to Mineola on Long Island to go to uh, Creation Comics. Mm. Um, and would buy comic books there. Um, and it, it's weird because comic books, you know, at the time, like, you know, there were certain comic books like Micronauts and like Watchmen, for example, mm -hmm. that were um, only in the direct market. Like, I experienced Watchmen kind of out of order. I would get the first two issues and then I wouldn't maybe be able to make it back to the store. Mm. So I'd get like issue five and I, I like read Watchmen, you know, kind of in, in chunks with pieces missing. Wow. Um, so it was it was it was tough back then, man. Back back in the the olden times. Yeah, but there was that that crazy sense of of this was ours that we were on the cusp of of, of seeing this. And like I said, I call us I call us the direct market generation. We yeah. we did not create the comic shops, but we were the ones that when we should have been aging out of the spinner racks that made us lifers, yeah. whether we wanted to or not. Uh, uh, the case in point, uh, we, our mutual friend, Howard Chaikin, uh, that that was the first thing I bought in the comic shop when I was really, I was getting my usual superhero titles, but that was American flag. Number three yeah. was the, was the one the guys were talking about. I'll give this a world. It changed my life. And the first time I met Howard, I said, can you change it back, please? <laughs> I bet you he uh, had something witty in response to that. You gotta work on better material, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I I can't imagine trying to comprehend uh, Watchmen out of sequence, but uh, you're you struck me as a pretty smart kid, and that. But this again, this was a, a curious thing too. You would just get used to that. Sometimes you would you would pick up yeah. a comic in the middle of a story. You know that the, the, the Spider Man's hanging off the bridge. Doesn't quite what to happen. Getting out of it, and you would sporadically get it around. It, it, you know, it's it, it's funny. Like now, everything is sort of at our, our beck and call. But like I remember, I got into like X Men with X Men One Thirty Nine, and um, you know, it was totally you know totally into it and totally fascinated. And it took a while to get a copy of X-Men 138, which was the, that was the the issue after the death of Jean Grey, where um, they basically, Byrne and Claremont took you through the entire history of the X-Men. And yeah. finding the issue was like finding gold because it was like, oh, this all makes sense. This was, you know, before you could just Wikipedia everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was very much that. You miss, you know, those little asterisks at the bottom, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, I haven't seen him since I fell off the bridge. A little asterisk at the bottom. It happened way back at issue 177. You remember that, don't you, Merry Marvel Marvelites and yeah. all those. You'd have to go hunting for it. You'd have to go. And, yeah. And I, I do kind of miss that. I miss I miss the excitement of, you know, hunting in the back issue, you know, bins uh, for, for that missing piece of the collection or that missing piece of the story puzzle. My Dead Sea Scrolls were the, uh, in the late 70s, uh, pocketbooks did the little reprints of the okay. Marvel Silver Age stuff. So we, they we, have to, we have to go on a trip. Hang on one second. Yeah, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. I'll trip my All okay. right. Yeah, I'm going to try to do this without killing myself. No, okay, no problem. We don't want that. Plus, nice. We did to see your, uh, your study. I refuse yeah. to call those rooms man caves. What? I, your study. This is how Mark died. Mark died. <laughs> Oh, oh, I have a this is these are the ones I grew up with. 
Oh yeah. I still have my collection. Yeah. Um, yeah. That those were those were the the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were yeah. the ancient texts. Those were I wasn't alive. Those those were the um those were the books that got me into Marvel. That's actually that was my gateway drug. Was yeah. uh, the the Ditko Lee Spider Man, um, you know Spider Man collect editions by Pocket Books. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 was really like sort of the first Marvel comics I owned were those little books. Well, the, the not a bad place to start at all. No, not bad. <laughs> Absolutely, those and uh, the when they did the Doctor Strange ones, the Eternity Quest yeah. is the war and peace of 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 comics, in my opinion. Totally. Still to this day, I just adore that one. So, so you were so you were firmly a lifer into all this stuff. Did you ever get an opportunity to go to any of the conventions? Uh, I did. I did. I grew up. Uh, I grew up on Long Island, and you could take the Long Island Railroad. Um, straight into Penn Station, yep. get out of Penn Station, walk across the street to the Pennsylvania Hotel. Mm -hmm. And they had these, you know, creation conventions and yep. you know, all sorts of comic book conventions. And um, that's how I grew up, um, you know, always going to those little conventions at that hotel. Uh, yeah. and back then they weren't that little. Back then they were the equivalent of, you know, uh, a, a major convention. Very much so. And it was all comics, and that's not to dismiss modern fandom or anything else too. But it was yeah. all long boxes and and guys trading the stories and yep, an original and, art, and you know, you you name it. It was it was all there, and really, it was it was exciting. I mean, that's I, I had a I, I was young, and uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. But I had a copy of Secret Wars number two, Secret Wars two number one, uh, signed by Stan Lee. Um, and I when I was waiting online, someone had given him like a copy of X Men number one to sign, and he's signing it, and you just hear rip as the pen ripped it, and without missing a beat, Stan wrote, "Torn by Stan Lee," and the date with an arrow to the, to the rip. Um, this is before the days wow. of CPP, so it seemed to have gone over well. I would I would really love to see what the people who do the crating when a comic is slabbed would think of that. Uh, yes, I, I <laughs> would be very curious myself. That's fantastic. So uh, you, like I said, you were firmly into it. Uh, you you interned at Marvel in uh, around ninety. Uh, yeah, I was. It was the summer of ninety of nineteen ninety. Wait, uh, ninety one. It was the okay. summer of ninety one. No, actually, no, you're right. It was the summer of 90. Summer of 1990. Okay, how'd that come about? Um, honest to God, I don't remember. Because um, <laughs> those were back in the days when you still could walk into Marvel. Yeah. And oh, yeah. if you knew, you knew somebody who knew somebody, you, 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 they'd let you in. I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember how I found out that they had an internship program. Um, yeah. I, I don't recall that. I might have read about it in like Marvel Age or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had an interview with uh, Suzanne Gaffney, who was, I think, Bob Harris's assistant at the time, or Tom DeFalco's assistant. Anyway, she was in charge of the internship program. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a um, an interview with her that went pretty well. And it was interesting. I My university would recognize... Um, the internship for Marvel, but it was a weird, I was in a weird catch 22 where Marvel wouldn't give me the internship unless the university would say they would recognize the credits mm -hmm. and the university wouldn't recognize the credits unless Marvel gave me the internship. And we that's went, a, that's an interesting challenge for a law student. It, well, my, <laughs> my solution was I wasn't a law student at the time. I was in okay. college. Okay. Uh, I was a sophomore in college, and my solution was I just called up Marvel and said, hey, the university is in. And at the same day, I called up the university and said, Marvel's in. Um, so, and that, you know, that, that uh, allowed me past the log jam. Have you ever used that before? Uh, no, that was a pure desperation move okay. born, of that, born of that moment. 
because you realize I'm picturing you right now with uh, two phones several years ago. It's like, yeah, Warner's is in. Yeah, CW's in. Yeah, DC's in. Actually, it, it, was, it was. It was two. Uh, I made the calls. I don't know why I remember this. I made the calls uh, off of these two pay phones uh, at the electric. Th this is back in, again, olden times. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the lecture centers had this hallway with these pay phones. Um, and I would, I remember standing by the pay phones, basically, you know, getting both sides to agree to each other. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So you got, you got in at Marvel and, uh, what was that, what was that internship like? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, it was a great experience. I interned, uh, three days out of the week, I interned in Terry Cavanaugh's office. Uh, Terry was editing Namer and Marvel Comics Presents and Excalibur at the time and some other books. Um, and uh, then the other two days of the week, I was interning for Steve Saffel at uh, Marvel's PR, you know, department. Uh, yeah. This was back in the days when the department was like Steve and and like, um, you know, Fabian Nassiza had just left uh, and there were literally two Macintoshes. There was a Mac. Mm -hmm. There was a Mac SE on that floor, and there was a Mac SE on the editorial floor, um, and uh, it was a great experience. I, I made some spare, you know, pocket change doing pay stuff. This is back in the days before uh, comic books uh, were lettered by computer. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I don't know how deep under, you know, deep into the rabbit hole you want to go, but like uh, John Byrne, who was doing Namer, he was really the first person uh, to do computer lettering. He he lettered, yeah. He lettered Namor himself <laughs> off of a computer font that he designed from Jim Novak's uh, handwriting. Wow, that's impressive. I you know I want to I I know Byrne was doing a lot of experimenting, branching out on the Namor book. He was doing that right. Zipatone with the underwater scenes that looked really Duotone. good, and yeah. yeah, the Duotone. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that was. I, 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 yeah, I a lot of different things. It was really, it was kind of cool. It was, it was, it was very cool. Like I was the one, my job was, you know, the pages were FedExed in and I would open up the pages, uh, open up the box and get the pages and have to make Xerox copies of them. And it was awesome. It was the great, greatest job in the world. It That's cool. It, it really was a, a a turning point in in the comic book scene at the time because everything that everybody talks about comics in the 80s was done yes watchman dark knight american flag crisis whatever mouse what, whatever flavor the uh, uh, comics them you like it had been a couple years there was not there's anything bad going on but there wasn't any of those bombastic put in a trade and 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 yeah. may Essex sort of thing and everything was just kind of treading water but i think in a good way until 92 with the death of Superman and image comics and, and that eruption. So it was, it was a very, it was an interesting time. It was a really, really interesting time because it was like at the precipice of, you know, the, the what would be the speculator boom and, yeah. and, you know, cover gags and you name it. Yes, indeed. So uh, you, you, Went back to school and finished that up. You became an attorney uh, yeah. and you were, uh, were you always writing on the side? No, uh, I was in my third year of law school, which is kind of like your senior year of high school. Yeah. Um, and my brother, Eric, I've got uh, two younger brothers. Both of them are writers as well. And yeah. brother Eric was in his senior year of film school and he asked if I would write a, a script with him. Um, and I did because you know, why not? I'm like being a senior in high school. And I really got bit by the bug. Uh, I hadn't done that much creative writing beforehand. And I really, really loved it. And I just found myself spending more and more time, even as I was practicing law, I would wake up at five in the morning to write. Um, and I'd write for like two hours before going into the office. Uh, and I would take all my vacation time and come out to Los Angeles and take meetings. Um, until, you know, I was, I was 29, I was in my fifth year of practice, which is really when you've got a sort of fish or cut bait on the whole partnership track thing. Yeah. Um, and I was disillusioned with the practice of law and I was thinking, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it now. You know, I have to do it before I'm 30. I have to do it before I have a wife, three kids and a mortgage. 
Um, so I, I quit my job and I moved on out to Los Angeles. What uh, did you have a speciality of law that you were working on? Or uh, I was a I was what's called a commercial litigator. Uh, so I was I was a litigator, uh, and we tended tended to represent companies. Yeah. Um, or there's a case with a company involved. Um, I always like to say like it was a you know there's usually a business on one or both sides of the V. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine the allure of Hollywood would. Uh, yeah, it, it was not a very, it, it was not a sexy, uh, it, it's a very stressful job and it's very adrenaline inducing if you're in the middle of it. But I always said no one would make a TV show out of the work I did. No, not at all. But uh, but you got enough nibbles and again, took in some meetings. Uh, uh, the the little blurb I read in your dossier was that you had, you had uh, either sold or optioned a romantic comedy. Yeah, believe, got you in the door. Not, believe it or not, that's how I broke in, you know, broke, depending on how you define breaking in. But basically, yeah. the, the script that I wrote, I, I'd written a bunch of different scripts. And the script I had written that sort of put me on the map, that got me a lot of meetings, that got me a lot of fans around town, was this romantic comedy. Uh, and that came about because my I was emailing back and forth with my manager. I had a manager, even though I was practicing law and hadn't you know broken in professionally yet. And she, you know, she would always ask about my dating life. And she's like, you're so funny talking about your dating life. Have you ever thought about writing a romantic comedy? And I basically, I wrote this, you know, this movie about a destination wedding. Uh, and I was, I had just broken up with this girlfriend who, you know, really wanted to get married. I didn't want to get married. And, you know, it was sort of all about like, how do you know that you're with the one? Um, right. And uh, that kind of, that actually the feedback I got on that script gave me the confidence that I needed to come out and, you know, move out to Los Angeles. And then once I did move out, I'd gotten hired on a show called The Practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was on The Practice, uh, Sid Scheinberg, who was the former head of Universal, he passed away recently, uh, his company, The Bubble Factory, bought my spec. Um, so it, uh, worked out nicely. And, uh, it's it never, it's never been made yet. Has it? No, no. Still, I mean, be told, it, you know, it's, I look back on it and it was such a product of where I was at the time. Um, yeah. now having since been married, uh, you know, I think a lot of my notions about marriage and commitment that I wrote back then were, were just really <clears throat> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know anyone creative, truly passionately creative, who looks at anything they did 20 years ago, regardless of the success, and says, yeah, yeah I love that the day I finished it up. So, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be scared to uh, reread it. <laughs> so you, uh, here you are, uh, just about ready uh, to, to start your new career, and you were, you were getting some pretty good traction in the TV scene at the time. You... Uh, mm -hmm. You did a uh, did a Dragnet episode, and I, I have I was very fond of that uh, that remake of that ser of Dragnet. Me too. I, I really loved it. What what happened there was um, I was working on Law and Order at the time, and Barry Schindel had hired me. Uh, he actually kind of stole me away from the practice. Um, and uh, I who was that new lawyer kid you got working for you? I need him over it here. Was, it was really kind of funny. I totally got poached. Um, and, <laughs> um, I did back in the, there was a this thing going on called bum fighting where they would actually it was it was really horrible they they yeah I remember that I remember that crap a completely amoral and scrupulous uh, video guy was was paying homeless men to fight each other um, yeah. and I I thought that would make for a very good Law and Order um, and Barry was really excited about it but then after my first year on Law and Order. He got hired. He got sort of moved away off of Law and Order to go run Dragnet, and he's like, "Would you mind if I take this, you know, this bum fighting story with me because I really like it?" I'm, I'm like, "Go, go with God." And he was, he was kind enough to give me a story by credit on the episode. Okay, yeah, because I was still curious about that because there's a story by, and I was yeah. like, "I know how that goes." <laughs> no, I, I cannot. It's funny, like uh, Dan Dworkin and Jay Beatty, who wrote that episode. Um, uh, they've since, you know, they since ended up working with my wife and, you know, we bump into each other from time to time. And actually, I'll tell you a funny story. So mm -hmm. I don't know how funny this is going to be now that I'm taking the leap. But um, so 
I happen, you know, I because it was one of my earlier credits, I had it framed. I actually had it framed with this uh, vintage dragnet uh, badge that um, that uh, um, a friend of mine gave me, and I forget why I had it. It was in my like years later, year like yeah. last year, like you know, within the last two years. It's in the trunk of my car. I forget why it's in the trunk of my car, and. I walk into an islands to go meet my daughters for dinner and there's Dan and I haven't seen Dan in years. Yeah. And I'm like, Holy shit. This is, this is like totally fortuitous. I run out and I get the, you know, the frame script and credit and I give it to Dan because he and Jay are going to get a lot more use and love out of it. It was their episode after all than I did. Yeah. The odds of that, particular item being in my car at that particular moment in time to bump into Dan, like the odds of it are beyond calculation. I don't know what force runs the universe, but it does have a sense of humor. I think we can agree about that. Uh, I think that much is very true. <laughs> that is very true. That is really great. Uh, yeah, you, you really... Again, that was a there was a there was a good strong scene at the time in television. Uh, a lot of procedural shows, law shows, uh, cop things going around. But the the nice thing is, is I think this was post. Uh, oh God, what was the post homicide years? And what was the one with uh, Bunts and and, and uh, oh uh, uh, well and, and NYPD NYPD Blue. Bunce, That's what I'm thinking of. Bunts was Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues. Blues. Dennis. He was played by Dennis Franz, Friends, who and was in NYPD Blue. Blue, Blue yeah. yeah, NYPD, tail end, kind of leveled up network television, and oh, yeah. they they were they were opening up ideas. It wasn't just you know chips and Hawaii Five O level of good guys, oh, bad yeah. guys. There was a flushing of well, so, You're talking about you know Steve Abachko and David Milch, yes. um, you know, and and they were really responsible for you know, uh, elevating the medium in a huge way. Very much so, very much so. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, in the trenches in the television years, uh, what 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 did you learn? Ooh, good question. Um, you know, it's funny, I learned a lot from a lot of really great people. Um, I also, quite frankly, you also learn a lot from the bad people. Um, yeah. You, well, you learn what not to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think really good television writing is a lot like an apprenticeship where you, you know, you, you put in your time, you work on a variety of different shows, you work for a variety of different people. And, you know, like any good apprentice, apprenticeship, you learn the craft. I mean, it's a craft. There's a, there's an art to it, but there's also a, like, it's learning how to be professional. It's learning how to talk to actors. It's learning how to hit your deadlines. It's, it's learning how to be a pro. Um, and you know, the, there's a lot of good people working in television who, if you listen to them, they'll teach you a lot of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, there's a lot of creative venues in the television and I feel like that's what comics kind of needs right now. They, I, I had a conversation with this with a couple of professionals about how DC comics presents or weird war tales, yeah. these, yeah. these, yeah, you know, tales I expected these. These small little seven, eight page stories. Oh, yeah. I need a backup for this. I need a backup for that. Where writers could sit with an editor and like, no, no, you got to do this. You try this and this isn't going to work. And now I just feel like people are, are getting plucked out. And yeah, there's, it, yeah, there, I wish there was that, that way slate for that sort of stuff. Yeah. So. No, there, there, there used to be, it was like more of a, there was more of a farm team, yeah. you know, a farm system. Um, and, and you had, you even had like, you know, I think we still have these, but not as much, which are inventory issues, which is, yes. you know, issues that were, you know, completed and put in a drawer so that if a book fell behind schedule, they would just pull something out of the drawer. Um, now they just allow books to fall behind schedule. Yeah. Uh, I, and that's. It's a, it's a just you know like like pretty much everything else uh, it's evolved and changed over the years. Yeah, and I, I again I miss those filling days. Well, well, mostly because we're at about that time that you were actually there at Marvel. I was I was cold pitching stuff when you still could, and I got a few phone calls from editors saying, "I love this. I don't want to buy this, but you're on my radar now." And then you know, then 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 things went south. 
Well, what was, you know, uh, what was cool about working for Terry is uh, he was editing Marvel Comics Presents, which was the, you know, the biweekly anthology. And that was how a lot of, you know, writers cut their teeth. That's, that's yeah. how Scott Lobdell broke in. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, because it was Braves, like an eight page, you know, story. Um, you know, why, why not take a chance on a new writer or a new artist? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, during those TV years, uh, it wasn't just all like, like uh, guns and procedurals. Uh, you did a couple of Jack and Bobby. So that was another show that uh, it wasn't on the service level. It was like, oh, okay. But you know, I started watching it and I was like, this got a lot of heart. Thanks. Uh, you know, what, what happened there was I, I was at the end of my fourth year in the business, the end of my contract at Law & Order. And I said to my agents at the time, I said, look, I've learned everything I'm going to learn from Law & Order. Um, I've got a good thing going here, but if you can find me the right show, um, I would jump ship. And by the right show, I meant I felt like it was time to branch out of procedural branch out of law shows and, and because I didn't want to get pigeonholed. And sure. I'm like, if you can find me a show that, um, that, uh, you know, is character driven, um, that doesn't have lawyers in it. Uh, yeah. I'd be interested. And my friend, Vanessa Taylor, who co-created the show with Greg Berlanti and Brad Meltzer and Scoop Cohen, mm -hmm. um, she had sent me that pilot and it, blew me away. I mean, just the script of the pilot blew me away. Then I eventually got to see the pilot and that was yeah. on a whole other level. And uh, I, I met with her and I met with Greg and, and it was, it was such a great experience. Um, was that when you first uh, creatively uh, hooked up with Greg? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to talk a little bit about that writing staff, that writing staff, is that's the deepest bench. I remember coming home uh, and then saying to my wife, I, this is, I, I can't keep up with these people. Like this is, this is the deepest bench I've ever seen. And every single member of the writing staff, in addition to the writer's assistant and the script coordinator, every single one of them became a showrunner. Wow. That is believe me when I tell yeah, you that's... that that does not happen. That is, mm. it is insane. Uh, and that show only ran for a year, unfortunately, because we, we premiered right up against uh, Desperate Housewives. Um, you were doomed. We were, we were doomed. <laughs> uh, in fact, we were dead on arrival. Um, I, we were shooting, we were shooting my episode, my first episode of the show. We were, we were filming, it was episode five, uh, when the show premiered. And we came in to the set uh, that Monday after, you know, we got the no overnight numbers and it, we all knew we were done. Um, and yet we all still had to go to, to work that day. And, you know, um, it was, it was done in by a former Lois Lane's show, no doubt. Yeah. The irony. The irony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Again, whatever controls the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was it was tough. Uh, that was that was a tough road to hope. But we got to finish out the season, and um, you know, you you got a good season into it. Uh, yeah, absolutely, you got to work with with that bench, and uh, yeah, uh, obviously, you and Greg Berlanti formed a tremendous partnership. Um, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> Greg, Greg yeah. and I were, were talking about the other day. We were we were like, this, this worked out okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um. When. What came? Uh, what came first, uh, developing Arrow or Green Lantern? Oh, Green Lantern. Okay. Green Lantern. Yeah. Because I, I, I will, I will say this right now. This is unequivocally. Um, I read your, I read the first draft, two thousand eight, with your name yeah. on it, Greg's name on it, Michael Green. Yep. That is the best superhero movie script I have ever read in my entire life. Thank you. I appreciate hands it. Hands down. Hands down. Hands absolutely down. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of heart in that. There's a lot of dedication to the core ideas. The fact that you worked Alan Scott into it. And in my head, I was picturing Ed Harris was born to play this role. I, yeah, uh, that, that is somewhere in a parallel world. That was the movie that got made. And I envy the people who live there. Yeah, I do too. I, you know, we'd be doing Green Lantern 5 by now. Um, you know, 
it's that's the thing I, I will say like you know and it connects to arrow because you know originally greg was supposed to direct the movie and um you know with the movie got away from us you know they they brought in another director or they brought in another writer and you know they made the movie that you saw um and you know when the question of doing arrow came up which ironically came up right before or right as Green Lantern was coming out, mm -hmm. um, Greg and I felt, you know, the only circumstances under which we would do this again is if we had the creative control that we didn't have on Green Lantern. So you this, know. this, uh, I won't call it a failure, but this under, uh, say no, underperformance, it was, it was, this, this underperformance led to greater things. Again, like you said before, you learned. You know, I, I'm a very, I'm a very big believer that every knock is a boost, and um, it was a learning experience for sure. Um, you know, I, my attitude is always, if you're going to go down, go down on your vision. You know, um, what was I think was really hard about you know the, the Green Lantern experience was is that we were associated with uh, a movie. Um, that made choices that we left our own devices would not have made. Um, and, you know, it's like, if, if you're going to fail, fail on your vision. Don't yeah. fail with someone else's. That's absolutely fair. That's absolutely fair. And again, like I said, it led on to better things. So, yeah, Arrow, how, 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 did, how did you sell them on? It's a superhero show, but it's not Batman. Well, you know, the the way we we sold it you know greg greg had a pitch for it you know greg greg had a vision for it which you know dark grounded you know um gritty crime drama um it, you know but you have to understand we you know warner brothers and cw approached greg and, and greg approached me at a time when green lantern had just come out yeah. uh the idea of doing another dc property with green in the title you know Greg and I, we had to think more than twice about it. And in keeping with the lesson of Green Lantern, we, we basically said, listen, we'll, we'll do this, but we have to do this in a different way. This sure. cannot go through the normal um, development process. Um, so we said, we'll, we'll take two meetings, one with the studio, one with the network. We will pitch you the show. Um, you, if you like it, then you will get a script from us. No story areas, no outlines, no development. That you, you will get a script, and at that point, you can decide whether or not to make the pilot. Um, and if you decide not to make the pilot, um, no one ever knew about it. You know, you'll yeah. you can search the internet; you'll not find a Deadline article or a Hollywood Reporter article or a Variety article about you know Guggenheim and Berlanti sell a uh, pitch for you know the Green Arrow. It, it never got published because yeah. this was all done, you know, really under the radar. Right. Um, and uh, I, I think as a result, we were able to really, you know, be very true to, you know, Greg's initial conception and the, the vision of making something, you know, that was, especially a network television at that point, very dark, you know, um, it, it was always back in those original pitches. We said the first act ends with Oliver killing a man in cold blood to protect a secret. Uh, sorry, that's end of act. That's the end of act two. And the end of act one is he has his hand around his mother's throat, uh, suffering from PTSD from being on the island. Yeah. Um, you know, we really, uh, you know, want to be true to that vision. I I think you have definitely definitely succeeded. Uh, what. <sighs> After the first season, it looked like okay, this this thing has has got legs. And uh, over the progression, did did you guys have a, a I guess a measure or a tempo that like okay, let's see if we can throw another character out here. Let's see if we can let's see if we can work Wildcat in. Let's see what we did. Did you was that ever a let's see how much we can push and how much we can get, or is it just hey, I got a good story involving this character. Let's do this. What's well, funny, you know, in terms of like folding in other DC characters, that ended up happening a lot faster than we ever planned. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we never planned on getting Slade Wilson into the show in season one or Roy Harper. Um, that being said, 
Greg and I, we had done a, a show before called Eli Stone. And Eli was always on the verge of getting canceled. Um, and when you're always on the verge of getting canceled, you don't wait to do your cool ideas. Okay. You, you, you are, you know, you're like, we're not going to wait till next season. We're going to do it now because we don't know if we'll have a next season. And, you know, the thing that Greg and I sort of realized was it gave Eli a certain pace, a certain narrative churn that we think really benefited the show. And we took that philosophy over to Arrow mm -hmm. and, and said, let's not wait till season two. Let's do this now. And it just, it made things faster, um, sometimes by design and sometimes, you know, by accident. Um, but, you know, it was really in keeping with this lesson that we learned on Eli. And yeah. I, think it, I think it served the show well. I, well, again, the, the its success is, it will, it will definitely attribute to that. Uh, I, there's nothing I can ask you about Arrow you haven't asked a million times before. So what's what was what's the moment you take from Arrow specifically that that resonates to you? Something you really you can actually look at and say, I'm really proud of that script, or I'm proud of that episode, or I'm just proud that we pushed this through. You know, I'll tell you, I think um, the uh, I, I think the 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 answer is going to depend upon which day you catch me. Because the truth is, over, <laughs> over eight years, there, there's a lot I'm I'm really proud of. Um, I have to say, I think you know, again, just catching me today, the work environment, both in the writers' room and on the set, that uh, myself, Wendy Miracle, and Beth Schwartz and I were able to really start crafting only starting in season four, um, you know, and it really then feeling it in season five. Um, it, it, I'm very proud of the fact that it was a place that, you know, people want to come to work. Um, and, you know, I think because I'm a big believer that that's the start. That's when you get the best work. You not, know? not every writer room can say that. No, so no, absolutely, absolutely. Kudos to you for for cultivating that environment. Well, I, I thank you. I, I think. Look, I it is not. I you know, like I said, we really started. You know, be, only being able to inculcate this environment starting in season four, and then we really were able to hit our stride in season five. And season five is it's my favorite season um, of the show creatively. So, uh, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. So. That was hitting the running. Um, when when did you just decide, hey, let's let's do something with Rip Hunter and a bunch of ancillary characters, and let's have some fun with that? How did Legends uh, begin yeah. to develop? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, we all sort we all sort of started to um, have these the same idea independently. Um, uh, but it, it really came about. Uh, Mark Pedowitz had asked for a third show. Um, we went down uh, a rabbit hole that I won't be specific about in terms of another DC character. Um, Peacemaker. Developing that. What? Oh, Peacemaker. He's uh, got a toilet uh, leaf for a uh, head. I'll tell you this. It was a character that you've seen, you've ultimately seen in the Arrowverse. Okay. And, um, but the feeling at the time was, how, how is this going to be any different from Flash? How is this going to be any different yeah. from Arrow? And, you know, Mark Pedowitz was saying, there's so many characters now, like really great characters played by great actors okay. that have been on the two shows. There's enough, there's enough stuff here uh, to field uh, a team. And when, when we hit upon team, when Mark said a team show, we realized that's what's been missing. That's something we haven't done before. That's something new. Um, and, and that, you know, is, is what started legends, which obviously has grown and developed and, and evolved, uh, in its, its own way. Um, but that, that was the, the beginning of, of Mark Pedowitz saying, I want a third show. And I think you've got enough from the previous two shows to create a team. Uh, he was absolutely correct, and yes, uh, and and that's again, that's been one of the, the great things about it was uh, just great casting across the board. Yeah, well, everybody. You know, it's it's so weird because yeah, 
in their costume forms, these characters, I'm like, well, that's they don't look like they're this, but they don't look like the comic versions. But the actions and the timbre and everything else to it. No, no, no. Yeah, that that's Professor Stein. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, I, I yeah. Love, you know, I think, you know, finding uh, look, uh, David Rappaport and Lindsay Baldessari, who are are the casting directors of the Arrowverse, um, and also of the Riverdale verse, um, oh, which wow. I don't know how they have the time. Um, <laughs> <Not really. laughs> but they they found all of these actors uh, for us, um, you know, uh, and 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 sometimes it's it's relationships. You know, uh, Victor Garber, for example, uh, was on Eli Stone. Uh, yeah. with, me and Greg. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, but but David and Lindsay, they just have this sixth sense almost uh, about um, you know matching actors to their comic book origins and being true to the comic book origins, even when it's not a literal you know translation. They're they're brilliant. I I can't say enough wonderful things about them. They're. Hey. They're as much responsible for the success of, of the Arrow versus anyone. So, and then, then we finally come to the thing that none of us ever thought we would ever see. How, how, where do you even begin to explain Crisis on Infinite Earths to the higher ups? Uh, well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, the, the way I think we try, the way we explained it, the first, the first, Pit, the pitches to the studio and the network always began with a little history lesson, a comic book history lesson about what the original comic book meant. Okay. Um, you know, um, it, it, because we had to contextualize it in terms of how important uh, that is, how what a seminal comic book it is, not just for DC comics, but for all of comic books. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, we really had to, sort of inculcate that and then once basically once we did we would just say and we really can't screw it up um and uh there were look there were a lot of times uh there there were you know people at the studio and people at the network who are comic book fans who understood what we were doing and there were people at the studio and people at the network who thought we were completely insane um you just but, spent you just spent half an hour telling me how important these characters are and you want to bring them on to kill them Am I reading that right? Uh, yeah, well, you know, one of the, <laughs> the phrase, you know, uh, the phrase that we used in the pitch a lot was, this cannot just be the Arrowverse. This has to be the DC multiverse. Uh, yeah. We have to touch all the corners of the deep DC tapestry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I kudos to the studio and the network, even when they thought we were crazy, and there were a lot of times when they thought we were crazy, they they trusted us uh and they said go for it um and uh we we were very lucky i it, at first i was like well they came up but i was like okay you know what uh, i'm okay they, they way the way john's flash and we always know john will come back because john's just too awesome to say <laughs> any character mm -hmm. and and, and again, just uh, at first I was like, well, okay, the little cameos, but then getting into it, like, okay, there, there's, there's heart in this. There, there, there's heart in this. You guys, you guys really, as, as I told Fitz privately, it was just like the guys pulled one over on the studios. <laughs> I think, I, I kind of think they did either that or they, or just like you said, though, you really took time to put it in context as opposed to, well, here's a character. We're going to, we're going to do this with them. I, so again. I I think it was a mixture. It was like there were some people who we won over. There were some people who understood from the beginning, and there were other people who, uh, you know, were paying attention to other things while we were getting away with murder. <laughs> no, that's fine. And again, a being being able to to bring closure to some facets that you yourself created, and then being able to open up new avenues for new talent, new actors. Okay, putting Batwoman on the map, and for me personally. I, I've sat with Brandon and I adore him and oh cool. Oh, they, they brought him in as the Adam. That's great. But seeing him in the cape and the shot, yeah, that, I, 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 I teared up. I teared I, up. I, I seeing that shot at the end, um I I was like, I I don't have to do anything else. 
Um, I'm, I've satisfied whatever I was, you know, jonesing to do. It was, and, and when I said earlier about, uh, about again, the Arrowverse and, and everything else too, um, it was very, it was a game changer for the convention world as well. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Because very much so because, a lot of the guests uh, from the show, you, you're, 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 the stuff you worked on, and The Walking Dead both came out at the same time. And the interesting thing was was that the the cast members from that were not afraid to go to the shows. And it used to be there was the stigma and the anxiety of, well, you do you do a convention when you need to, as it is. You know, it's like not as opposed to when something is on right now, a as I call it, a living fandom striking when the iron is hot, and that brought in people. Again, as I always say, like nowadays, we have an entire generation of comic book fans that have never read a comic in their life. And that's not a criticism against them. It's just an observation. And that that brought in people and brought in people continuously. Yeah, I look, I think it's it's great. I think, you know, those those of us who have who have done conventions from on the pro side know how exhausting they can be. And I think it's so great that the actors um, not only do the conventions, but, but really love them and really enjoy interfacing with the fans. And um, it, it is, it's funny. Every, we talk about even just going to San Diego Comic-Con every year, maybe not this year, um, and just how important uh, that fan interaction is to the process of doing the shows because it really recharges all of our batteries. Yeah. It gets us all really excited. And honestly, I don't know how we're going to do it this year without Comic-Con because the high that the cast and the writers get from San Diego Comic-Con, we ride that high throughout the entire season. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm not alone in saying that we're really going to miss it this year. Oh, we're all missing it. Uh, we're thinking, fingers crossed that, maybe in some form we'll bring physicality of the experience back maybe late summer autumn it's still it's not off the table uh, look i i think you know uh, the the hope is we get back to some semblance of normalcy as soon as we responsibly can safely can again i'm a humble employee of galaxy con but i'll tell you right now you and uh, your peers and anybody if you want to come to one of our shows in, in autumn and drop an announcement bomb the invites there okay i, I appreciate it. I, I by the way you know that reminds me like I, I have to thank spencer beck for you know connecting us uh spencer's an awesome guy i've known him for absolutely years, years um and uh you know so he's he helped make this possible uh, again, Spencer, I'm sure you're watching. Uh, always a pleasure. Thank you for facilitating this. Uh, let's go in real quick. We got a couple minutes left. Um, while you're doing all this stuff in TV, uh, you were still writing comic books. Yeah, yeah. All this time, you and and again, I you've spoken before about uh, you have a wonderful work ethic and and combined with discipline, uh, which I think definitely has enabled you to to do all this stuff, but you've done some very, very solid comics. And if anything, once again, to bring up his name, uh, you got Howard Shaken to draw Dr. Doom. That alone is, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I love, love, I love Howard to death, both as a person and as a creator and, and especially as a collaborator. Um, and uh, yeah, he just, he, you can't, by the way, there's, there's, he, he's the most fearless man in comics. Um, you cannot ask him to, for anything that scares him. You know, there, there's no way yeah. to scare him. He just, you know, he just uh, relishes every challenge. Did they, so how'd that work? Did did someone just give you a call of like, do you want to write Blade? Or did, were you going around, invited, were you invited to pitch ideas? Or at no. that point, could you just walk in and say like, hey, I'm Mark Guggenheim, what want to write? Uh, no, uh, I had I had basically finished uh, the Wolverine arc that tied into Civil War. Yes, and yes. I got an email from Tom Brevoort, uh, who said that they're relaunching Blade. Um, you know, I don't think even think Howard had been attached at that moment. Um, he just asked if I would I would do it. He, you know, the the high concept was was pretty broad. It was it was basically integrating Blade more into the Marvel universe. Yeah. Um, you know, and I thought that was a genius idea because look. You know, Blade has traditionally been a hard sell. Uh, you know, 
no issue had gone more than no series had gone more than a certain number of issues, um, you know, less than 10. Um, and, you know, I think Tom, I, I don't know what it was about um, my writing that made me, that made Tom think I would be a good choice for this, but I was grateful to him. Uh, and it was, it was a great experience. I had a phenomenal time. And you've certainly done some other stuff. You had a very solid run on, on X-Men Gold. Thank you. Um, I have to admit, I disagree with uh, uh, the Serpent Society is not a bunch of jobbers. <laughs> I, I forget why I wrote that. Um, I forget why I wrote that. I, I think you were just, you were, make, you were making Kitty Pride look cool. That, I'm all about making Kitty Pride look cool. Well, I again, we're the same age, and she was the right age, and yeah, that was Kitty Pride was our generation's uh, jubilee boom. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, how much? I mean, and like I said, you know, my first issue of X Men was 139, which was the Welcome to the X Men Kitty Pride. Yep. By the experience issue, so my experience with the X Men has really dovetailed with her experience with the X Men. Absolutely. What's been uh, the moment you've taken from uh, from a fan interaction? Is there just this is a memory that just that lingers with you that so you're always going to hold in high regard? God, there's so many. Honestly, um, I know. You know, I, I yeah. I, oh, I, I'm I'm. You got me stuck. Uh, to pick a particular one. Um, you know, I, I was doing a comic convention after Christ on Earth X, and there was a lot of uh, controversy surrounding the shows because of a particular individual and a, a, lot, of, a lot of anger, uh, you know, justifiable anger. And, and one fan came up to me and she was very, uh, she was really upset. Um, and we just had a really honest conversation and, you know, by the end, I think, you know, we, we not only walked away with a, uh, an understanding of each other, but an affection for each other. And we've since kept in touch via email. And, um, I, I, I find, I like, truth be told, I, I, the fan interactions I enjoy the most are the ones where you can really just connect as human beings. Um, even if you start off from a place of conflict, um, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, those are always the most rewarding ones, you know, for me. Um, I mean, but they're all rewarding because it, it still blows my mind that, that anyone, uh, you know, consumes my work and, uh, would want to talk about it with me. Like that's pretty incredible. Uh, the fact that anyone wants to get a photo with me is amazing. It's I'm, you know, because I'm I started out as a fan, and I I still consider myself a fan more than a pro. Um, so it's it's all very uh, you know it, it's all very surreal, quite frankly. It's never stopped being surreal. Um, there's still a big part of me that feels like the real me is still back in Boston practicing law, mm -hmm. who never made the trip out west. Well. We wish the Earth 2, or actually he'll be the Earth 3, Mark Guggenheim, doing the job that he never wanted to do. We wish him well. Uh, and we're, we're glad to have you. partner by this point, poor bastard. Uh, geez, uh, geez. What's the, uh, what's the dream project? Ooh, dream project. I would love to, three things, three, three dreams. Awesome. Work on anything Star Wars related. Mm -hmm. Write a movie for Marvel. Mm. Billy Joel biopic. Ooh. Yeah. What would you call it? I would really like to avoid calling it Piano Man because that's just so friggin' obvious. Um, yeah. The innocent Piano Man. Um, potentially the Entertainer. That's also a yeah. one. Um, and not as not as obvious a one. The boxer sings. Yes, he was a boxer. That's true. That's very, very true. I didn't know that. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I look forward to hearing that announcement in the trades. Uh, yeah. uh, we're just about at time. What, uh, what's on the horizon that you're allowed to share with us? You know, that's, I tell you, that's what's really tricky. Um, everything I'm working on right now is not public yet. It's incredible. Um, uh, I, 
I'm literally like, I'll read in the trades, like so-and-so is writing this and so-and-so is writing that. I'm like, how does that stuff make it? Like I, I, I'm working on, on four, five different projects in various different stages, none of which are public. Um, so it's, uh, it's I, I don't know if this is simplified as I will say it is on your IMBD. The word, two words, true lies are listed. That, uh, I can tell you what's happening with that. Um, uh, that was a pilot I wrote. It's actually my, it's for me, it's the one that got away. Um, okay. I, that was such an interest. I love that movie. And it was such an interesting challenge to turn it into a TV pilot. And I was so proud of the job I did. And the, uh, the, it was like this, it was the day after I turned in the script to the network, Eliza Dushku, uh, you know, went public with her experience on the movie, mm. uh, which was really awful and really bad. Um, and really kind of, it, I think it at the moment, in that moment in time, really tainted the brand um, and, and tainted the title. It, suffice it to say, trust me, when you deliver a script for a pilot to a network, it, it was not great timing. Um, it was bad timing um, uh, on, on my part. Um, and uh, they just decided, as, as so often happens with a lot of pilot scripts, not to pick it up to pilot. Uh, and then once that happens, it's kind of dead. But uh, yeah, that, and so I will say that's one of those scripts that kind of like the Green Lantern uh, movie draft. Um, I would love it if it somehow made its way out onto the internet because I'm really, really proud of that script. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, thank you. On behalf of myself as a fan and a convention professional, again, thank you for your body work. Thank you for your dedication. And again, you, you brought in an entire new generation into this wonderful, wonderful culture that we've cultivated over the years and we're we're in the we're in this great chain of geekdom as i call it and yes. uh, you have you have made such a tremendous mark and just thank you bro thank you thank so you much. thank you and uh we relationship we, yeah we wish you uh, wish wish you and your family well and uh hopefully once uh once these present times uh clear it up uh, we get back to work and we will see your work on television and hopefully we can see you on one of our stages I would love that. I would love that. Well, thanks very much, Patty. I really appreciate Absolutely it. Absolutely very much. And for those of you watching, thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much. Just to let everybody in real quick, tomorrow night we'll be sitting with Bill Jameis, the former publisher of Marvel Comics. Then Saturday, we're starting one of our first of our GalaxyCon virtual hideouts. We'll have cast members from My Hero Academia, Monica Real, Colin Clink and Baird, Lucy Christian talking about that, as well as Sunday, our virtual hangout will be members of the cast of It, Jeremy Ray Taylor, Jack Dylan Grazer, and Jason and Robert Scott. On uh, Wednesday the 6th, uh, we will be having a virtual hangout with some people from Tiger King, Joshua Dial and James Benson. And on Saturday, May 9th, we'll have a virtual hangout with Nightmare Before Christmas, Chris Sarandon, Jack Skellington himself, and Ken Page, the Oogie Boogie. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you much for joining us. On behalf of all of us here at GalaxyCon, we wish you and everyone well on your home planet. Take care, be safe, and be well. Bye-bye. Be -bye. safe. Thanks again for tuning in to GalaxyCon Live. Make sure to check out our online store at galaxycon.myshopify.com where you can find t-shirts, signed and certified Funko Pops, autographs, collectibles, and more. For updates on the upcoming streams, visit us on Facebook at GalaxyCon Live or galaxycon.com.